This tape contains a message by Brother Bill Britton concerning Revelation 11, the temple of God, and the two witnesses. And now may the Lord bless you as we take you into the service where the message is coming forth. Worship and, and others of the houses that we call houses of God will be place of worship. Actually, this is not the house of God, this building we see, for God is building a house. And this is what we want to speak of tonight, is that temple which God is building. Now in the 11th chapter of the book of Revelation, and uh, beginning in verse 1, and sometimes I, uh, I go rather rapidly, not recognizing that some of this is new for some folks, and uh, uh, that they need to take it a little slow, and so I'll try to sort of hold down tonight because we're into a little deep water here and try to go slow enough to where that we will pinpoint these things with a scripture that you might, uh, you're clarified as to what we're talking about. Uh, I know that this is a very controversial subject. There's been many interpretations as to who the two witnesses are, as some have said and told me and very vehemently and and emphatically that the two witnesses were um, Elijah and Moses. Others said it was Ezekiel and John the Baptist and uh, various ones, John the Revelator and Enoch or Elijah and Enoch for various reasons. And uh, one that uh, feel that Enoch was going to be one because he had to die and he didn't die the first time and so he has to come back. But the Bible plainly says that Enoch was translated that he should not see death. Amen. And so those that are in heaven, Jesus says, with him now, are as the angels and cannot die. These are the words of Jesus, that they that are there cannot die again. And so there's not going to be somebody from heaven come back and die here uh, as these men do. We see in this place because they, uh, can, uh, Jesus said they cannot die. And Enoch, of course, uh, was translated so that he would not see death because of his faith. Now, I recognize this is controversial, and that's all right. Uh, if, if you don't, uh, if you want to hang on to uh, past uh, interpretation, you feel that's better than what we hear tonight. You're at liberty to do so. You have my permission. I'll not cram anything down anybody's throat. God bless your hearts. I, uh, I want to show you, uh, share with you what the Lord has shared with me by the Spirit and with the scriptures here, and so uh, if he quickens it to you, wonderful. If he doesn't, that's all right, too. Praise the Lord. I'm, I still love you, and I trust that you'll still love me. In uh, verse 1, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel said, stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. Now I want to consider, first of all, that word rod. In Ezekiel chapter... 20, we find that word used there, uh, Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 33. As I live, saith the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand and a stretched out arm. These are very significant terms. I trust that you know this already, that the hand of the Lord is very significant in this day as God is revealing the ministry of the hand, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastor, and the teacher. And so uh, we won't go into all of that, but you recognize that the hand that God is working with is that ministry which he has anointed and raised up and has had in his church since he first gave it to the church. I don't ever read where he took it away from the church, and it's been here operating and ministering, sometimes unbeknown to historians, Though they did not record the work of uh, God's hand down through the ages, yet there has been a ministry. Uh, even in times when it seemed like that the dark ages uh, covered over and there was no light, yet somewhere in somebody's heart the light was shining and there was a ministry and there was persecution against those who walked in truth. Now, and then the stretched out arm, of course, uh, is God's overcomer and... Uh, the, uh, the power that God is using here uh, uh, manifested through this arm to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed. And with fury poured out will I rule over you. 
And I will bring you out from the people and will gather you out of the countries wherein you are scattered. And certainly God's people have been scattered uh, and the sheep have been scattered because of the shepherds into many nations of, uh, call them denominations if you want to or whatever you have for it. But God's people have been a scattered people and Ezekiel prophesies in other places concerning those uh, prophets and those shepherds who have scattered God's people up. But here he says, I'm going to bring you out from those countries where you've been scattered. This is one of the works that God's going to do through his hand and through his arm and through the fury or the judgment that is being poured out. When judgment is in the land, thy people will learn righteousness. And so it is. It is necessary that judgment begin at the house of God for they have been a scattered people and with fury poured out with a mighty hand and a stretched out arm will God rule over them. And he said, I'll gather you out with a mighty hand, with a stretched out arm, and with fury poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the people, and there will I plead with you face to face, like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt. So will I plead with you, saith the Lord God. And I will cause you to pass under the rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. And I will purge out from among you the rebels and them that transgress against me. Did you know that God's going to have a pure church? That God's going to have a church that's where the rebellious and the transgressors will be purged out? He said, Arise, O Jerusalem, as Zion put on thy beautiful garments, that shake thyself from the dust, for there shall no more enter into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. God's bringing his Zion. God's bringing his city, God's bringing his church to a place of where there will no more come in the hypocrites, the unclean, the transgressors, but God's going to have a pure church because he's going to plead with them in the wilderness and purge out of them the transgressors. And he said, I'll cause you to pass under the rod. Amen. This is the rod of his authority. God has authority. God has a discipline in the church and God's going to establish this discipline and this authority in his church. And, and he gave John a rod and he said, now a reed like unto a rod. And he said, now John, rise and measure the temple of God. And don't measure the city, don't measure the court that's without the temple and measure it not for it's given to the Gentiles and the holy city shall they tread underfoot Forty and two months, or three and a half years. Now I want to use, take that word "measure" and see uh, something about it. I was just reading, by the way, in the Lamb's uh, uh, translation uh, out there. Several around here have that translation, and I looked up to see what this word "measure" was in there. And the word in the Lamb's uh, brings out that it rise and anoint the temple of God. And that certainly bears witness to my heart with the very thing that is meant here when he says measure the temple. This temple measures up. The city doesn't measure. Now in the 21st chapter of Revelation we find where he gives him a golden reed and said now measure the temple. But from the time of the 11th chapter uh, here to the time of the 21st chapter something is happening to the city. But the city is measured up there in the 21st but here in the 11th chapter the city is not measured but it's the temple which measures up. Now, where do we find this word measure? In the fourth chapter of the book of Ephesians. Praise the Lord. Uh, we find this scripture, Ephesians 4. God gave some apostles, some prophets. This is his hand uh, that he's ruling with and uh, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And hallelujah. Now he says a little further down that we're speaking the truth in love, uh, that we may grow up into him in all things which is ahead, even Christ. And so today he says we are growing. But he said we have these ministries in the church that they might bring us to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Hallelujah. Now, I've been speaking for the last few nights concerning Christ and, and concerning this body of Christ. And, and I feel right now that I'd like to read just a, a couple of paragraphs here concerning this body of Christ. 
in this vision by Tommy Hicks. Uh, Tommy Hicks, for you that don't know him, a mighty man of God, man that's been mightily used of the Lord in the revival in Argentina, in Finland, and behind the Iron Curtain, and across the world. And here, uh, last July 25th, he had a vision. He says, on the morning of July 25th, 1961, at 2.30 a.m., I received a vision from the Lord that has entirely revolutionized my whole life and ministry. He begins to tell, I won't read it all, but there's just a couple of things. He tells about how that his face, it seemed like he was lifted up with a view of the world before him. His face was turned towards the north with a great flash of lightning covering the entire earth. I looked down and beheld a massive form that appeared like a huge giant. I was amazed as I saw this giant cover the earth. Its feet seemed to reach to the North Pole, its head extended to the South Pole. The arms were dramatically spread from sea to sea. Again, with another great flash, I saw this giant was alive, and yet, strange to say, struggling for life. I said, God, what does this mean? This massive being was covered with debris, trash, and dirt, uh, and seemed to be fettered. As I viewed this being, it seemed to quiver, then almost go into convulsive gestures. As this took place, I saw thousands of strange-like creatures. Every time the giant would quiver, they would withdraw. However, when it ceased to move, they would return again. I was definitely made to know what these creatures were. They were instruments that had bound the body of Christ through the ages. Suddenly, the right hand of the giant. Now, this is significant. I don't know how much he knew of this as far as doctrine or revelation of the Word, but God showed him a revelation of the Spirit and a vision, how that the first thing that reached up into the heavens that God had a ministry here that had to ascend. And I declare to you preachers tonight that if we ever expect God's people uh, to come to the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ, then the ministry has got to submit to the Lord and, uh, and come and rise up into the heavenlies and claim those things that belong to us. So he said the right hand of the giant came up and with that a loud voice like a roar of thunder from heaven itself. Then his left hand was raised and as I looked slow, uh, I saw the hands extend into the very heavens. Then very slowly the giant began to rise and with the giant hands began to clean the debris from off its body. This is the ministry the hands had was to cleanse the church and purify the church by the washing of water by the word. Can you believe that? Amen. I saw it rise to its feet with a hand outstretched to heaven, so great that its hands were in the heavens while one foot was in the sea, the other was on the earth. I trembled immensely, for never before had I seen such a sight. Presently the sky was filled with clouds, heavy clouds, but lo, they turned to silver, until from the very silver clouds themselves came liquid drops of light and power on the form of the giant. I saw the giant melt to earth as though it was being poured out from heaven. The form had seemed to dissolve, and now in its place I saw millions of people. I cried to the Lord, what is the meaning of this? A voice so clear and vibrant said plainly, I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten the canker worm and the caterpillar and the pommel worm, my great army which I sent among you. As I listened to the voice and watched the multitude of people from the clouds came great drops like liquid light. This majestic heavenly substance made everyone it touched lose their identity and their identification was Jesus. I saw no barriers, no denominations, no sects but the transcendent glory of heaven that rested upon these people compelled them to lift their hands in praise and adoration. Again, there was a pouring forth from his hand, this that I call liquid power. As soon as it would touch the person, that person would have his hands bathed and dripping in the same heavenly substance. Uh, upon receiving this anointing, they would walk into hospitals, through the streets, uh, into the institutions, and on and on. Marching throughout the length and the breadth of the land, I could hear them saying, according to my word, be thou made whole. And as the liquid power, power flowed from their hands, each one they touched was instantly healed and made whole. I saw people transported in the spirit from nation to nation. I saw them going to Siberia, to Africa, to Canada, to the ends of the earth. I saw them literally lifted up by the spirit, placed by the spirit in the respective countries. I realized that this whole panorama picture was a demonstration of the kingdom of God through those who follow him. I continued to see a stream of people marching, healed, blind eyes open, deaf ears unstopped, literally millions receiving of the power of this great manifestation. It seemed so fluid in his operation. There was no exaltation of a man. Simple words were repeated according to my word, be thou made whole. Well, that's not all of it, but you're welcome to get one. But the thing that we're men mentioning here is that Jesus has a body that is going to rise and grow. Amen. And is now in the process of edifying itself in love and growing up into him in all things. 
which is the head, even Christ. Hallelujah. Growing up into him in all things, that we might come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. This is going to happen on this terra firma that we call earth in these physical bodies here in this generation i believe it with all of my heart that it's in this generation that this is going to be brought about can you say amen hallelujah all right now he says rise and measure the temple of god somebody's measured who is it that's measured? The city isn't measured. Now, we know who the city is. The Bible's very plain. The Bible says over here in Revelation 21, Come, John, he said, after John said in the first verse, I saw uh, the holy city, verse 2, uh, New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven adorned as a bride prepared for a husband. And in verse uh, 9, the angel came and said to him, uh, uh, Come hither. I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. Glory be to God, we're going to see that one uh, that has been talked about in the Bible, that one that has the beautiful garments of praise, that one that the Lord uh, loves and is uh, purifying and is going to glorify and is going to share with her all of his glory there throughout the ages, endless ages of eternity. Here we're going to get a picture of the bride, the Lamb's wife. Uh, and he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Hallelujah. But here in chapter 11, we don't find that city having the glory of God. We don't find it coming to the measure. As he says here in chapter 21, uh, he said, A reed was given to me. He that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. Amen. And he did measure that city and it tells all about the beautiful things. I wish I knew what all those meant. I, I, I've got a vivid imagination and I could draw pictures as I've heard others do uh, and tell you what the different sardonic stone and the uh, various stones mean, the sapphire and all those. And I've heard of some that sounded beautiful. But I, I tell you, I do not believe that uh, we have come to the place yet where we know all the truth there is about what those things mean in that city. I believe down the line God reveal that. I don't believe that he'll leave that there without showing somebody what all these things mean. I believe every bit of this Bible is going to be understood before God's through with his plan and his purpose in mankind. Amen. But I, I, I don't believe we, we know what all those things, but I do see where it's having the glory of God and there's a beautiful city and what a wonderful thing there is here. And he said there's a reed given to, and told me to measure this city. But here in the 11th chapter, he said now, Right now, he said, don't measure that city. He said, that city's got to go under some tribulation. That city's got to go under judgment. That city's got to be trodden underfoot 40 and two months. Uh, now, what does that mean, trodden underfoot? Uh, well, in Isaiah 28 and 18, it speaks about those that would not move with God. They would not hearken to the word of the Lord, though they were God's people, but they would not move with God. And he said, when this thing comes, it's going, you're going to be trodden down by it. Matthew 5, 13 says that salt, ye, speaking to his people, he said, you are the salt of the earth. But if his salt loses its savor, that is, if a salt loses that quality, uh, that makes it salty and that, that life preserving that uh, saltiness that makes them thirsty if it loses its savor what is it good for he said and these are the words of the savior himself it's good for nothing to be cast out and trodden under the foot of men and I declare to you today that in the general sense the church I'm not speaking about those that God has his hand on for his divine purposes here the first fruits of that company that's going to uh, bring in the glory of God but I'm talking about the church in general today has lost its savor it's lost this saltiness and it's just been uh, settled down to an old formality and a ceremony of going through their dead rituals and whether it's dead Pentecostal rituals or dead Catholic rituals it makes no difference they're all dead rituals hallelujah or dead move of God rituals whatever they might be amen and believe me brother the dead move of God rituals can be more sickening and deader uh, than Episcopalian or, or, or Catholic or, or some of these other rituals. They can be worse and they stench worse when I get around them. They, they make me sicker than they do when I go into some of these other churches that have been dead for a long time. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. I, while I was in Japan, we was in a city that had been bombed before and had been so completely bombed that they hadn't even buried the dead. They just left them lay and covered up by the rubble there. And some of the men went in began to clean off and I tell you uh, with their bulldozers with gas masks on they went in and began to clean out places to stack lumber and things and you could drive a quarter of a mile down there and the stench of that uh, thing all made you sick uh, as you drove along the stench of dead flesh but I want you to know that the stench of dead flesh in the spirit uh, is worse and no doubt is sickening to the nostrils of God in this day let us not uh, uh, get into such a, a ceremony and a ritual as that. But here we find that the city is, uh, in other words, shall be trodden underfoot for three and a half years. Um, and so he said, this ye are the salt of the earth. Uh, and if salt loses that uh, saltiness, its savor, then it's to be trodden underfoot. And so we find here that he says, rise and measure the temple of God. I want to talk just a minute about the temple. God told David he's going to have, one of the, uh, going to have his sons uh, or his son that's coming from him to build him a house, a temple. Now we find over here in the book of 2 Corinthians, I want to make it just as plain as possible. It couldn't be any plainer to me, and I hope not to you either. Uh, that here in the second Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 16 says ye are the temple of God this is a church he's speaking about here he says what um, uh, talking to the church be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers what agreement have the temple of God with idols for ye are the temple of the living God in Ephesians uh, chapter 2 of the book of Ephesians and uh, verse 19 therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are be built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are builded together for the habitation of God through the Spirit. And here he says that all the building is built together in Christ Jesus and upon the foundation there was fitly framed together grows. Here's a temple that is growing. Amen. And is fitly framed together. I want to read this in the Amplified. It's so beautiful uh, there. And there's a word used that just uh, describes what God is doing in this hour. And it says here, uh, in him the whole structure is joined that is bound and welded together harmoniously and it continues to rise, grow, increase into a holy temple in the Lord, a sanctuary dedicated, consecrated, and sacred to the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. Now the word I want to bring out there is that word welded. It said you. Amen. The whole structure here uh, in him is is uh, joined or welded together and the thing that God is doing today with his people and I find this is so true there is a joining together of God's people until they're being actually welded now he takes a lot of heat to weld people together and God's putting a fire to us and, and he's welding us together and did you know I found out one time a long time ago when I had something welded I looked at that thing <coughs> as a man put the torch in there and he stuck that little piece of rod up there and the first thing he handed it to me said here it is I said now wait a minute is this as strong as it was before he said son that's stronger than it was before he said if it ever breaks again it'll break somewhere else it won't break where I welded it because the weld is stronger than it was any place else than it was before it broke amen and I found that this is true that when it's properly welded together and, and that's put around that if it breaks you can put the strain on it it'll break somewhere else but it won't break in the well amen and so that's the thing that God is doing is he puts the heat to us he's welding us together into a holy temple in the Lord that Satan himself cannot divine now some of you folks were here the other night and I believe yesterday morning 
uh, when Brother Thomas and Benny Skinner was here. I just met Benny Skinner for a brief short time in uh, Southern Pines last November. He just happened to come in the last few days of the meeting was there. But there was something happened when, when uh, in those services as God joined that little fat boy to me and there was a welding made there and, and, and there's something done in the spirit until I tell you what, I believe he'd lay his life down for me and I, I trust I got the courage to do the same. I, I got the desire now to lay my life down for him. There was a welding and a joining together. This is better than just being in the same denomination or believing the same doctrine, but there's a joining together, amen, as God is bringing his temple together. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, uh, let me read another one here in 1 Corinthians. 3 and verse 16. Praise the Lord. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God? Amen. And I want to read this from the Amplified because a lot of people go around strutting out, throwing out their chest, you know, and they say, boy, look at me, I'm the temple of God. I beg your pardon. His church is his temple. Amen. And we are living stones making up that temple we are members one of another to make up that temple and if that temple ever gets completed and if i'm a part of it and you're a part of it you won't get there without me and i won't make there or get it there without you it takes all of us to make up together these living stones to build god's temple now in first corinthians 3 and 16 in the amplified it says do you not discern and understand that you the whole church at Corinth are God's temple, his sanctuary, and that God's spirit has his permanent dwelling in you to be at home in you collectively as a church and also individually. Praise God. So uh, there, there is a collective in the church, a dwelling of God, just like there's a dwelling of Christ in my heart. There's a dwelling and a habitation of God in the spirit in his body, his temple, of which Jesus himself is the head of the corner. Now in 2 Corinthians, I wanted to get this thought also. In, we've already read the scripture in King James, but here in the Amplified it says, What agreement can there be between a temple of God and idols? For we, we, that's all of us, are the temple of the living God. Amen. We're not all, all just little temples running around, but we together, the whole church, are the temple of the living God. Hallelujah. Now, he says here in chapter, uh, well, also we want to notice over in Revelation chapter 3 and uh, verse 12, Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. So we find that this temple is made up of the overcomers. Hallelujah. If you'll permit me to use that word in the plural, it's not used in the Bible in the plural. They always mention the overcomer in the singular, him that overcometh. Uh, hallelujah. But uh, uh, that's because this body is one body. Amen. It's not a separated, divided body into under many heads uh, as the uh, church world is found today, but it is a one body under one head, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So we find in verse 1 in chapter 11 that he says, measure the temple of God. And I declare to you folks that somebody is going to come to the measure. All the city is coming to the measure at the same time. Can you believe that? Is that what the word says? Or am I twisting it or anything? Or does it say that part of the city is coming to the measure before the rest of the city? Amen. There is one structure in the city. Hallelujah. Suppose this platform was a city of Jerusalem with the walls around it. And there's different structures here. There's Herod's palace. There's a sheep market down here. There's a school of Tyrannus. There's different uh, buildings. There's dwelling houses all through here. But over here is a, uh, is a structure that, is, that uh, has the Shekinah glory of God in there. That's where God meets with man. Amen. That's a structure he has especially chosen. Amen. To first manifest his glory. Hallelujah. Now I got news for you that when the temple or when the city is measured up, that is said that the whole city has the glory of God. 
Amen. And the glory of God is manifested out of the entire city. Every member in the church is going to manifest and, and, and uh, uh, magnify the Lord and glorify Him here in this life and manifest Him to the whole world. Every member of the city, of His church, of His bride. But before that happens, there's one structure where the Shekinah glory is first going to appear. And we find this in chapter 11 in Revelation coming to the measure. Hallelujah. Now, I hope I didn't lose anybody. I'll just lay it out real plain. Like I, I always tell them, boy, now translate that for me. Get it down in my language. It's where I can understand it. Just the good old corn-fed Missouri language where I was brought up. I want to know just what it means. It simply means that God's got a great church. We try to say, oh, well, me and my little group and, and our little fellowship, we're the church. I beg your pardon. God's got people you've never heard about. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. A lot of them are going to surprise you, and they're going to be there <laughs> in his church. Hallelujah. But I tell you, some of them that are falling down on the child are going to have to be trodden underfoot and go through some tribulation before they make it to the glory of God. This is a day not to trample underfoot the, the word of the Lord and the thing that he's bringing forth. This is a day not to miss your opportunity to enter into that which God is doing, for you'll be sorry if you do. Hallelujah. And I tell you, amen. Uh, here, uh, now what I'm saying is this, that God's got a great people, glory to God, and he's going to manifest his glory in them. He's going to deck them with beautiful garments. But I want you to know that in all those people, he's got a called out people, uh, a wheel in the middle of a wheel, as it were, uh, a people within a people, amen, a call out people. Uh, that call out of those uh, who have heard his call, those who have been chosen. Uh, many have been called, but few have been chosen. He said to his disciples in the 15th chapter of John, which we are studying tomorrow in Sunday school, and everybody be here for Sunday school if you can. And um, uh, he says there, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And there is a divine ordination in the purpose of God today that he's laying his hands upon whom he will. This is a day to press in. As Paul said, I'm pressed toward the mark for the prize of that high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Trying to get just as close as when I got saved as a young teenage boy, just 18 years old, just had got out of high school a few days before and I was facing the world, and my life was laid out before me, and there I had my little canoe, you know, and the, the steering gear on it, and I was ready to go somewhere. And, and I'd been under conviction for a long time, and I got busy with God, and I got to thinking, now, if this thing is real, if, if this is really real now, uh, uh, I better find it out. And if what these people are saying about the Bible is not true, and if it's, not, if it's not true, then I better just forget about religion altogether and throw it overboard and uh, get rid of it and live my life and do the best I can without it. I have a cousin that did that very thing. I got a letter from him just the other day. He's sick in his body, dying with TB in a hospital. He's just a couple of three years older than I. We were almost like brothers. And he decided there wasn't anything to it. He threw it overboard. He was going to paddle his canoe and go his way. And I wrote to him when I found out his address. For years I've been praying for him and trying to reach him, trying to get a hold of folks that, thought, that I thought might know where he was. And finally, uh, out of a blue sky, he wrote to my mother from a TB hospital, a veterans hospital up in Omaha, Nebraska. And uh, my mother sent, him, uh, sent me his address, and so she knew I was trying to uh, reach him. I wrote to him and told him what God had done for me in the last 20 years and, and asked him what had been happening to him. He wrote back and, and he said, nothing has happened to me. He said, I'm sick. And he said, I, I've been able to maintain a firm position at the bottom of the heap. And, and there he was. I have no hope, he says. And I have no, uh, I can't believe anything. I wish I could believe in religion. I wish I could believe in God. But I can't believe in anything, he says. And there was no hope for him. He said, all I can look forward to is just to die and be oblivion. He said, I don't fear retribution. He's not afraid of hell. He's not uh, looking forward to reward or going to heaven. He said, all I'm looking forward to is die and be dead like a dog, in other words. And, and that's all the hope he has. Well, that's the life he took. And I decided uh, about that time. I said, well... 
there's got to be something here. If this is true, then I want to know it. If it's not true, I'm going to do like Buddy. I'm going to forget the whole thing. But if it is true, then I better get in it with all I've got and go whole, whole hog or none. That's what the term we used to use down in Missouri is whole hog or none. Either get it all or don't get any. Amen. So I decided as an 18-year-old boy, I better that this thing was real. It was right. And if it is right, I better get all I can get while I'm at it. I didn't have long here, and I better do all I can. I jumped in with both feet just a scratching and a clawing. Amen. And I tell you, my heart was breaking as I sat there at the typewriter to answer his letter and try to tell him the reason why he's at the bottom of the heap dying without God and without hope and why, on the other hand, I've been supremely happy. God has moved in my life in the last 20 years and how uh, that God is, has given me everything in life that I could possibly ask for or request of, and how that, uh, that the, the happiness that flows uh, through me and out of me is, is so supreme I can't even, uh, I can't even express it and, and why this is so. It's because I chose Jesus Christ uh, as my Savior and gave everything I I had to him. I don't know why I'm digressing like this, but just the same as it's all right. Somebody needs it. Now listen, I want to tell you a little fable. If you'll permit me, I don't tell many fables in the pulpit or many jokes or anything like that, but I want to tell you a little fable. It seems that two men were traveling through the countryside at night going to their destination, and as they traveled through the dark forest, they heard a cry for help. And a feeble cry, it seemed, off their journey. And so they, they stopped on their path and they hunted for uh, whoever was in trouble. And they found a little old man uh, that had uh, a tree, a large tree limb had fallen on him. And there he was pinned to the ground. And, and so they went over and they lifted the tree limb off and got him out from under it. And he was very grateful. And he said to them, I am so grateful you have saved my life. And he said, I want to reward you. He said, as you journey, you're going to cross a dry creek bed down the way. Tonight, on your journey, he says, when you do, stop and pick up uh, some pebbles out of the creek bed and put them in your pocket. And he said, in the morning, you're going to be both glad and sad. And so that sounded sort of strange, but they went on their way and thought no more about it until they got to the little creek bed. As they passed through in the darkness of the night, they passed the creek bed. Why, uh, one of them said, hey, remember what the little old man said? That in the morning we'd be sad and glad. So let's try this and see what it is. And so they reached down and picked up some pebbles and put them in their pocket and went on their way. And in the daylight of the morning when it came, they thought of this. And, and so they stopped and they, they reached in their pockets to see what they had. And as they pulled it out, they had priceless gems, jewels, rubies, pearls, and diamonds and emeralds and all these priceless things in their pocket. And oh, how happy they were that they remembered what the little old man said, that they stopped and picked this up because they were rich beyond their wildest dreams. But how sad they were that while they said it, they didn't get more. Amen. You hear what I'm saying, Christians? This is a time to jump in and get everything you can get for God's got things prepared for his people that I hasn't seen here, hasn't heard, and man hasn't even imagined the things that God has for his people. So while you're at it, get everything you can get. <laughs> Glory to God. And the way to get everything you can get from God is to give him everything you've got. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Where were we? All right. The temple measure the temple of God. There is an anointing. And, and I'm glad that I saw that in the Lambs of Translation. Uh, there that this word measure is translated anoint from the old Peshitta uh, translation there. And I think that is proper because at the time of the measuring of the temple, there is a divine glorious anointing that comes upon the sons of God who are in this temple company. Amen. When he wrote back there to the church and said, you are the temple of God, he wasn't talking to everybody in the world. A lot of the heathens that didn't fit that at all. And a lot of the city didn't fit it either. A lot of those that were in the city or what we call the bride didn't fit this. But those that were in the bride who was in this temple company, who living stones made up this, of which Jesus Christ himself was their head. Amen. I don't know who your head is tonight. Maybe it's yourself. Uh, hallelujah. For the Bible says in, in Isaiah 53, we have turned everyone to his own way. 
Amen. But Jesus desires to be Lord in your life. Every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess Jesus Christ to be Lord. But before that happens, he's going to have a people that walks the face of this earth and demonstrates him as Lord in their lives. Amen. Glory to God. All right. Now, before we get too far here, gone, I may have to finish this. In fact, I will finish it some other time because... Um, I want to talk just about a bit about the two witnesses here, and then some other night, perhaps uh, Monday night, the Lord willing, I'll be speaking on the rest of this on the Moses and Elijah, which seems to be signified here by the ministry they had. I want to speak concerning Moses and Elijah ministry, and we'll do that if the Lord wills Monday night. Sunday night, I feel the Lord is speaking to me to, uh, to preach on the day of the Lord. Don't miss that Sunday night, if at all possible. Now, he says, The court that was out the temple, leave out, measure it not, for it's given to the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread. By the way, you know, somebody says, Well, Brother Bill, we've already received an anointing. Why, I got the anointing of the Holy Ghost. I spoke in tongues. I walked on air. Yes, so did I. So did Paul the Apostle. But in the 8th chapter of the book of Romans, he said, this which we have received, uh, this which we have who are in this company, he said, this is the first fruits of the Spirit. Uh, that is the pledge of greater things to come. Glory to God. And I have a, a tract. I think I might have some with me. I believe I do. If I do, I'll lay some of them out here in the back and uh, uh, probably tomorrow next day. And it's a, a, a message. Part of a message was written uh, years ago by... Dr. Charles Price, and many of you perhaps heard of him, a man that's gone on to be with the Lord now, I guess around 49, 48 or 49, he passed away. But in 1948, he printed a message in the Golden Grain. And in this, he was seeing greater things coming than what he had ever seen in his ministry or in his life. And he had a miracle ministry. He had a, a, a miracle life. He had an anointing upon him that few men that have walked the face of this earth have ever uh, enjoyed the ministry and the anointing that Dr. Price had upon his life. Uh, and yet he said there's something coming that's so far greater than that which we now have. That is, it makes us just look like a few little sprinkles while that is a mighty deluge that's coming from heaven. And though we do have an anointing, and I thank God for the Holy Ghost, uh, I thank God for the anointing of the Spirit uh, and for the gifts of the Spirit uh, and all the blessings that we have through this gateway of the Holy Ghost baptism in the great and glorious spiritual things. Uh, yet I declare unto you that they are only an earnest of the inheritance. They are only the first fruits uh, of Canaan land. But God has purpose and this is not uh, after we all die and go through the grave and get on the other side over there. But I declare to you that in these bodies here that God's going to have a people that's going to manifest the fullness of, of the anointing of the Spirit even as Jesus anointed it in his own ministry and life. Amen. Glory to God. Jesus manifested the glory of God. And as we've been preaching for the last few nights uh, with many scriptures um, that he is the pattern. And if he's a pattern, then we've got to be made like him. Hallelujah. He was made in all points like his brethren. And he's going to make those brethren in all points like him. For we are to be conformed to the image of him who loved us and gave himself for us. For in Psalms 133, says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment uh, upon the head, even Aaron uh, that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, talking about the high priest now. Amen. And he says, talks about that anointing for the high priestly ministry and that anointing that was poured upon his head that ran down his beard. And oh, as we look at the life of Jesus, uh, the head of this body, the head, the chief cornerstone of this temple. Amen. Uh, the, the life of this harvest as we look at him and we see this divine and glorious anointing that rested upon him, how he walked upon the water, how he broke the bread for thousands, of, how he spoke to the fish, of, how he, he, he commanded the demon spirits that do his bidding. Of, and all 
the glory saints, how he gave life to the dead and healed the sick, gave sight to the blind and raised up the crippled, glory to God. And what a divine anointing there rested upon him who is the head. And I declare to you, bless God, that that same divine anointing, not a different one, not a lesser anointing, but the very same anointing that came upon the head, as the Psalms tells us, is going to run down the beard, even to the skirts of the garment, till even the feet of this body shall put underfoot every principality, every power, every enemy of the uh, of the mankind, how that the, every enemy of God is going to be put, not under the head, but under the feet of this body. Oh, can you praise him? Glory be to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. We love you, Jesus. Glory to God. He cut up a bush and cut up a stack of it and cut it. Glory be to the Lamb of God. Hebrews chapter two tells us, and he quotes uh, Psalms chapter eight. He says, "What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visited him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor, and did put all things uh, under his feet, uh, and in that he put all under him. Oh, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now." And this is A.D. 64, 30 years after Jesus was resurrected and ascended upon high and spoke the words that all power is given unto me in heaven and earth and put the principalities and powers and satanic hordes of demons to an open uh, shame and, and, and broke their power and broke their, uh, their dominion there and ascended to the throne of God. After 30 years after this happened, he said, we don't yet see all things under his feet, but we see Jesus crowned with glory and honor. We see the head of this body. We see him with dominion. We see him crowned. We see him upon the throne. But he said, this is not the eternal purpose of God, for God's not going to stop. He's not going to rest, he says, until all your enemies are made your footstool, which is a resting place, not for the head, but for the feet. The pillow is a resting place for the head, but the footstool is a place where the feet rest. Jesus spoke one time, said, you see that man? He said, what do you expect to see when you come out here? A reed shaking in the wind? A man clothed in soft raiment? Why, he said, you find those in palaces. But he said, this man is a prophet of God. And he said, he's more than a prophet of men born of women. There is none greater than John the Baptist. But he said, the very least in the kingdom is greater than he. Why? Because it's a completely different realm for those that enter into that kingdom have absolute dominion over every principality and power including that last enemy which shall be put under the feet of the body of Christ which is death itself. John hadn't come to that place for death overtook him. Amen. But I tell you that God's not going to rest and this work is not going to be finished until there's a people that walks the face of this earth and that has dominion and power and, and rulership over every enemy of God until every principality and power is under their authority. And this anointing that comes upon the temple in the 11th chapter of the book of Revelation is something we have not yet tasted of when he measured you see, amen, and that word measure means anoint there. Then let us apply it also over there uh, in the fourth chapter of Ephesians. It says he's given us apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers until we all come to the unity of the faith unto a perfect man. Not unto perfect little men, you know. Uh, but unto a perfect man until we see that perfect man that Tommy Hicks got a vision of for oh, where that he was from his he uh, feet up to his head clothed in glory and saw that man as he was the very uh, image of, of the Lord Jesus Christ and yet he saw him broken down into people and they went forth under divine anointing and under orders from the Lord himself and minister the very life and power of God into those who were needy and we find here that uh, he's given as apostles and of prophets and evangelists and so forth for the perfecting of the saints for this work until we come to a perfect man unto the anointing of the measure of the, uh, the anointing of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Hallelujah. We're going to see that full anointing for in John chapter 3 he said the Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand and him whom God hath sent he giveth unto him not the spirit with measure, 
but he given them the Spirit without measure. Amen. We have received a measure. We have received a first fruits, and, and we thank God for it. It's more than I could ever got uh, in the world. Amen. And I tell you, if that's all I ever got out of this, it'd be well worth anything it's cost me uh, and far beyond what I could pay for with my sacrifices and tribulations and troubles and persecutions and whatnot, even if they chopped off my head or tortured me on the rack or anything else. What I've received from this first fruit has been far greater than what I've ever deserved. Yet he says, Amen. That this one that God has sent, Amen, the Son that is sending, He said it gives to Him the Spirit without measure. Amen. Glory be to God. Well, in chapter 11 of Revelation, give me just a few more minutes and I'll say something about the two witnesses. We're down to verse 3. I will give power. This is that anointing is spoken of where He said, uh, anoint the temple or measure the temple here. I will give power unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days twelve hundred and sixty days forty two months or three and a half years clothed in sackcloth now i want to say here uh what uh, what this is talking about clothed in sackcloth amen these men this is, they have not their robes of, of eternal glory and honor on they don't have their kingly uh, robes yes i know we're priests and kings under god but they don't have their kingly robes they have their sackcloth on uh, and they're ministering not in their uh, glorified bodies uh, but they're ministering in their old physical body of humiliation uh, in philippians chapter 3 and verse 21 it says our conversation or conduct is, uh, our citizenship is in heaven from whence also we look for the savior the lord jesus christ who shall change our vile bodies that is this body of humiliation and that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body which is body of glory the margin says here and so he's going to change these vile bodies that we might have a body of glory even as our lord jesus christ has now but the ministry that comes in these two witnesses does not come in a body of glory amen i've heard fellows running around over the country and i've gone to their conventions and their meetings and and tried to uh, see what it was they were trying to say and and I've heard them say how they were glorified, they were manifested sons, they were already resurrected, and, and so forth. I just didn't understand because I wanted to stick a pin in them and find out. I just didn't understand what they were talking about, that they were glorified and resurrected. I, 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 I just was dumb, you see, and all that. But I, uh, I've heard them say all of this, but I want you to know that if that's true, they've missed this ministry here because this ministry is not in the glorified, resurrected body, but this two-witness ministry is clothed in sackcloth or in this body of humiliation. Now, he said, I will give power to my two witnesses. Now, what does this two witnesses mean? Now, uh, I, I declare to you tonight, and I'll just make it as plain as I can, that uh, these two witnesses is not two little men running around by the name of Moses and Elijah or, or John the Baptist and Ezekiel or Enoch and somebody else, but... Um, this is the body of Christ, the temple of God, that he is anointing, that he's measuring, that he's giving power unto. And he didn't change the subject here. He's talking about the same thing that he was talking about in the first two verses. And here he says, I will give power to my two witnesses. Now, if that's so, then why does he use the word two witnesses? Why didn't he say, I'll give power to my witness? Amen. And uh, why did he use it in a plural sense? Well, two in the Bible is the number of witness by the mouth of two uh, or three witnesses. Let every word be established. It was a Bible rule that there had to be at least two witnesses to a truth or a man could not be punished. He could not be judged unless there were at least two witnesses. And so two is a peculiar number because it is the number of witness and it also is used in the Bible as the number of Christ in the fullness of his body. And this is typified at the Feast of Pentecost where there was two wave loaves. How that, that uh, he signified these two wave loaves was when Christ came at Pentecost and was joined to his body there forming the church. This was his witnesses. Even in the fifth chapter of the book of Acts, uh, they told there in the early church, they told uh, the, the, the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin, they said, we are his witnesses. And also, so also is the Holy Ghost, which God gives to them that obey him. Now, we've been preaching here for the last few nights, and this is an established fact. I don't think there's any way anybody can get around this in the Word, that Jesus Christ is the pattern. And all things pertaining 
to the sons of God, uh, the overcomer, the body of Christ, the hundredfold company, the temple company, whatever you want to call them. It's only one company here that we've been preaching about all week. And uh, uh, those, uh, the, the scriptures and the prophecies that refer to the body of Christ must first be fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ, for he is the head of this body. And those things pertaining to the body must be fulfilled in Jesus. Now, if this is true, that puts me on a limb. Then I got to show where Jesus was two witnesses. Is that right? For if the body is going to be two witnesses in the end of the age here upon this earth, then I declare to you that somewhere in this Bible that there will be a witness and a testimony that Jesus, the head of this body himself, while he was here upon the earth in his flesh, was two witnesses and not one witness. Now, is that plain? Did I lose anybody? You with me? Jesus, while he walked upon the face of this earth, he was the head and the pattern for this body, so it's necessary then, if, if this is true, that we are two witnesses, and if these two witnesses are the body of Christ, he himself will be shown to be two witnesses. Now, I want to read you a scripture that will make that very, very plain. Couldn't be plain. You don't have to twist the word of God when it's there. All you have to do is just look at it and it's there. Amen? Glory to God forbid that I should ever try to twist something around to make it fit up with what I believe. I run into something don't fit up, then I'll fit with it. Hallelujah. If you don't believe that, I, it's happened. <laughs> Glory to God. I've had to fit a lot of my thinking to what God says. Now, in the book of John, chapter 8, of the gospel of John. Praise the Lord. John chapter 8. Verse 12. Then spoke Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself. Thy record is not true. Now, what they were referring to was Deuteronomy 19.15. For in Deuteronomy 19.15, Moses had laid down a principle that is still true today. Jesus reiterated, and so did Paul the Apostle in the book of 2 Corinthians, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses shall let every word be established. So there had to be two witnesses for the witness to be true. And they said to him, you bear witness of yourself. Your record is not true. And that's what they made reference to. But Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true, for I know whence I came and whither I go. You cannot tell whence I come and whither I go. You judge after the flesh. I judge no man. Yet if I judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone. Listen to this, folks. Verse 16. For I am not alone, but I am the Father that sent me. It is also written in your law, and he's referring to Deuteronomy 19.15, that the testimony of two men is true. I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me bears witness of me. How many witnesses was he anyhow? If he was one witness, he says, then I'm not true. What I'm saying is not true if I'm just one witness. But he says, you look at me, you just see one body. That's all you see is one. But there's somebody invisible you don't see, and he's witnessing. Amen. And he says in John chapter 5, he explains how that he witnesses. John chapter 5, he said, uh, verse 31, If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. If there's just one witness, it's not true. He, he declares this. There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know the witness which he witnesses of me is true. It says, for, but I have greater witness than that of John, for the works which the Father hath given me to with finish, the same works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. And the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. He says, you haven't seen the Father, you haven't seen his shape. But he said, he bears witness of me. For the works that he gave me to do, the same works that I'm doing, he said, they bear witness that he that sent me is with me. Amen. Now, beloved, I declare to you that Jesus said 
as my father. Our time is gone on this tape. I trust it's been a blessing to you. There's a few minutes left to the message, but we do not have space on the tape for it. So God bless you and write for more tapes and literature. Didn't he? By the works that he did. John chapter 10. Amen. Jesus says in verse 25, Jesus answered, they said to him in verse 24, If you be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you.